offer had offered yeah. 1.5 million for this one. Mm -hmm. Morgan has been a fixture in the MBZ and has been a major contributor to the Brunel Survey Project. But to give him due introduction, you know, Morgan comes from, I would say, a relatively impressive background. A couple, you know, got his undergraduate degree at Harvard, one of those small schools, <laughs> a master's at Oxford before joining Steve's lab here at Berkeley. And as many of you know, he has really been the avian component in a lot of ways of the Grinnell Survey Project. And he's written, as part of that, a paper that's emerging as a very seminal, important paper was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences on avian changes in the CRO over the last 100 years. I suspect we're going to hear a little bit about that today. I honestly, I didn't ask Morgan if this is an almost your finishing seminar or not. Should I ask um, that question? Or is that I asked Steve about it, and he says, you have to be finished to get it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I still have one semester left. So, But it's probably as close to actual an actual defense as I'll come. Okay, so you guys are here for that moment. <laughs> but anyway, I'll let Morgan take it away. Today he'll be speaking on 100 years of half formal change in the Sierra. Thanks, Morgan. Thanks. So... I've, you know, I've been a grad student for six years, and I'm always surprised by sort of the lessons you learn every time you give a presentation. No matter how many give, presentations you give, there's always something that comes up. And it's kind of like sitting down to sort of have a good photo taken of you and suddenly having a <laughs> ground squirrel pop up in the middle of the frame and try and ruin your photo. And I found that sort of happened this week because I was, you know, a week ago I was ready for my presentation, and then uh, my laptop crashed a week ago. And I took it into Apple, and they said three days, and I didn't get it back till yesterday at 4 p.m. And so I was really convinced, actually, that I was going to be giving the first modern MBZ chalk talk. <laughs> but lucky for you, that is not the case. Um, my research, as many of you know, is uh, basically all founded on Joseph Grinnell, who is really should be a co-author on all of my papers. Um, no MBZ Grinnell talk would be appropriate without basically a good photo of Grinnell, um, and one of his prescient quotes, um, talking about uh, how, bas you know, how we should really be taking the best notes that we can and collecting as much data as we can, because we don't know how, how what use that data will come to. Um, and we're sitting in the room that's sort of a, a, a sort of a, a, in, in honor of that. Um, and uh, and so I've had really the luck to sort of go back and sort of dig around in Grinnell's journals um, and sort of really walk where he walked and redo what he did. Um, as a side note, as part of that, I've discovered this is actually not the first photograph that they took in this series. This is the second photograph. The first one was actually ruined. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just a, just a general outline of my talk today, I'm going to be giving some really, really basic background to the Grinnell Survey Project, because I'm sure everyone here has actually probably heard at least something about it. Um, uh, then talk about sort of what we found in terms of evolutional movements in Sierra Nevada birds, and then finally looking at sort of trying to understand those movements from a more climate, per climate perspective. So when we think about Grinnell's legacy, often in the museum here, we look straight at all those cases um, and look at the specimens that he's collected. And certainly Grinnell and his colleagues in the first 40 years of the 20th century sampled a whole lot of California and collected a whole lot of bird specimens. Um, but the focus of my dissertation is actually over here on this side, and just what's come out of the field notes. Um, and Grinnell really was ahead of his time in taking pretty systematic bird surveys. Um, so he created this census sheet um, and sort of decided that, you know, he was going to start talk, uh, you know, marking sort of hour-long periods of time. And in this case, he was climbing last and peak. And so the elevational bands he'd be in during those hours and keeping a full tally of the numbers of individuals and species he found. And so he did this, and this is another example from Tracy Storer in Yosemite. Um, sometimes they didn't have the, no, the field pages at hand, so they just kept a list of the species and did tallies. And sometimes they did the tallies sit on another piece of paper and then transcribed it into the field notes. Um, but I've been able to go back into the field notes and sort of extract out all these surveys and be able to use them as a historical baseline that I can go back to and resurvey and resample to look at how the bird species and bird communities have changed over the last hundred years. Um, this project started before I came, and it really started in 2003 with the first Yosemite project, um, going into Yosemite um, and, do, and doing samples of, of, of mammals, but then birds. And Andrew Rush, who's here, right? 
saw him come in, right, in the back. Um, Andrew pioneered this in Yosemite in 2003, 2004, when he was an undergrad, uh, before he left us and then came back. Um, I came on in 2005 and started um, my work up in Lassen um, in 2006 and 2007. We expanded down into the southern Sierras and what we call the Whitney transect in 2008, 2009. We also did a small bird survey resurvey project along the I-80 corridor in 2008. Uh, Peter Panchin, who's a postdoc, is now doing bird surveys on coastal California, and I think it's probably continuing this summer, Pete? Yeah, all the data's collected. Oh, yep. it's all done now, 2009-2010. Um, and then also a former field assistant of mine and someone we all know well, Austin Schultz, um, who's an undergrad here, did a resurvey of campus in 2007 to 2008. A side note that I'm not going to go into a whole lot, but it's really important to how I actually analyze my data, is how we compare our two data sets. Because we have our sort of modern bird surveys taken in sort of a modern methodology, and we're trying to compare it to Grinnell and what he did in his time. Um, because the methods are different, are slightly different. And in any time you're comparing these observation data, you have this issue of, the, of false absences, um, where you have species, or you have, you have basically a species that you did not find at a site. And how do you know that actually the species was not there, a true absence versus a false absence? The species was there and not detected. And so there's a method um, that's been developed over the last uh, five years or so known as occupancy modeling, um, where you take repeat surveys at a site, um, and you use this to calculate for a species in a site a probability of detection. Um, so you can model this probability of detection, and you can use that probability of detection to conditionally model the actual true probability of occupancy of our species at a site. And the modeling, this modeling framework has a lot of flexibilities, and one of the powerful things about it is to be able to relate different covariates to both the probability of detection and the probability of occupancy. Um, and so, for instance, we can test for, when, for whether or not um, there's a difference between time periods and the probability of detection of a species, or and also the difference between time periods and the probability of occupancy. We can look at how um, the probability of detection changes for a species over the course of a breeding season as singing frequency and, um, and activity changes over the course of a breeding season. And it can also relate the probability of occupancy to a lot of other factors related to questions we want to answer, such as how um, occupancy changes over an elevational range, how it changed over time, and how it can change across our three survey regions between Yosemite, Lassen, and the Southern Sierras. And so in the sort of a in analyzing of my data, I've taken a bunch of different detection models, and I've taken different parameterizations of occupancy, and I've modeled them all on a whole bunch of species. And you combine this into a single sort of average model, um, uh, which will relate in some ways is this probability of occupancy um, along an elevational range. And so we can model this sort of the true occupied elevational range of species and how that varies over region and over time. Um, so this, I've done this for a total of 114 sort of pretty abundant species found in the Sierra Nevadas. And to summarize what that we've shown, before I go into my results, I want to talk a little about uh, sort of what we actually know about birds and climate change. And I'm going to keep this pretty brief. But a lot of the studies that have been out there and that have published looking at bird avian response to climate change is, is phenological. Um, we have evidence of species migrating earlier, of species nesting earlier, of species fledging earlier, and that's where a lot of the research has been focused. The other flip side of that is the expect expectation that as temperature is changing, species are going to be changing their ranges. Um, there's been some good evidence in Europe and in North, uh, Europe and Britain of species of bird species shifting northward um, and latitudinally with warmer temperatures. Um, and there's been at least two studies across North America of species shifting northward, but that's also only for the winter range. While we expect species to be shifting north, we also expect them to be shifting up in elevation. Um, we don't have great evidence in this case. Um, the best examples that we have, um, particularly for birds, are from tropical locations. Because of these difficulties in actually having long-term research studies, very few of our time series are longer than 30 years, even though we get decent signals in certain cases for 30-year time periods. Um, and across all studies, there's a problem, particularly in elevational areas, of getting replication over any sort of spatial scale to know that what you're seeing locally is not just a local effect, but is actually a regional or continental effect. So to, sort of, uh, to get at this, uh, we, uh, the data set that the Grinnells provided us um, so it actually allows us to compare across 100 years and across three different um, sort of elevational cross-sections of the Sierra Nevadas. Um, so I've already talked about these three regions, uh, but this is sort of the foundation of, of my research, looking for species shifting upward in elevation. 
and sort of you can look at sort of one one case and one example and see just kind of what that data looks like. And so here we have these dot plots of both uh, the historic time period and the modern time period for our three regions. And with this example of the morning dove, you can see that its its upper elevational range has shifted up in Lassen, it has shifted up in Yosemite, and then shifted up in Whitney in varying amounts. And this is what you get out of occupancy modeling. This is uh, the historic curve, and in the brighter, lighter color, the modern curve, showing that in each of these cases that, that model op true occupancy has shifted up. <coughs> and we can look at one species, but looking at one species doesn't tell us all that much, um, because we can't actually provide, prescribe any causality to it. We can't say that these didn't shift up by any other response. It, not, it might be temperature, or it might be something else. Um, so for that, we really want to look at sort of aggregates of species and look at species groupings as a whole um, and see what all species are doing to see if there's any sort of uh, pattern that is, that is consistent across all species with climate change. And so when we're looking at, at uh, range changes, we can have sort of a hypothetical mountainside here with a, a hypothetical species that's distributed across. And as we model that, you might get this expected curve where the probability of occupancy relates with elevation, and this is the area where the species occurs the most. And then we can look at three different parts of how the range might be changing. We can look down here at the lower elevational limit and see how this changes over time. We can look at the upper elevational limit, and then we can look at the middle. Um, in this case, I've analyzed it by using the median of the cumulative occupancy curve um, to basically try and get an idea of how the distribution as a whole, and perhaps the distribution where the most individuals are, has changed. So we can. So I'm going to present results for these three different areas separately. Looking first at sort of this median, median occupied elevation, or what's happening in the middle of the range. Um, if you look across uh, these species for all three regions, and these graphs are these, the fraction of species in each region that have shifted up, shifted down, or not moved at all. And when you're looking at this range as a whole on aggregate, you can see that we have this really strong um, signal of species shifting up more than they are shifting down or not moving. And this is pretty. This is what we'd expect, and this is consistent with what we find um, in other parts of the world and other studies. Um, you can see that there is some variation. Whitney certainly doesn't have uh, have as strong a signal as the Lassen in Yosemite. And that'll become clear um, as we look at the other range limits too. But when you take all of these species in the three different regions and you put them into a, um, a mixed model with species as a random effect, um, you do get this coming out that across all three regions you have this significant, um, uh, significantly more movement sort of up in elevational range um, and down in downward or no change. If we look at the lower limit, so the lower range limit can either stay the same over time, it can shift down, which is meaning range expansion, or it can shift up, which would be a range contraction. I would split these up in terms of the species that are found um, that are basically low elevation species and high elevation species. Because we found that species, are, uh, the, these, these bars actually shift very differently depending on which of these two groups you're looking at. So if you're looking at the <coughs> low elevation species first, these light green bars, pretty much low elevation species are not having the lower elevational limits change at all. Um, one here, zero here, two here, and seven there. Um, there's not very much happening for the lower elevation limit of low species. High species have a strong pattern, particularly in the Lassen, of shifting up. When we put this into a mixed model, um, we don't have any significant effect of region, but we do have this elevational zone significant effect, showing that there's something different happening between low elevation species and high elevation species. When you look at upper range limits, again, your upper range limit can expand, it can move up, it can contract by moving down or it can stay the same. And you look at across the two elevational groupings of species, we find that, high, that, that low elevation species are actually moving in this case. So low elevation species are expanding up and they're shifting their upper elevational range, um, while high elevation species aren't doing that at all. And this pattern is very strong in Lassen and in Yosemite, and it's slightly there in Whitney. And when we put this into a mixed model, we get the significant effect of both elevational zone and region, particularly differentiating last and Yosemite from Whitney. And so we look then at uh, sort of median range, uh, upper limit shifts, and lower limit shifts. We find that on the whole, species are moving their entire range up in elevation, although there's a fair amount of variation. Low elevation species are expanding upwards, 
in, low ele in high elevation species are contracting up. And that's the general pattern we get, but there's a whole lot of variation. The next thing we wanted to look at was we have all these species that are acting different ways. Are there any, is there any sort of predicting of, you know, of a life history correlate with uh, whether or not a species has shifted its, upper ele or shifted its elevational range up? Um, and so we collected data on, I collected data on body mass, home range size, clutch size, um, the territoriality of species, and then two types of migratory variables. One was whether or not the species was a year-round permanent redis, resident in an area. Um, and the other was whether or not it was a, was a broad neotropical migrant. And when we put this into our models and tested it with uh, the median elevational range, or sort of the range-wide, whether or not it, it, the, range, the whole range had shifted, um, the only predictor that actually improved the model at all, um, and only marginally so, was this neotropical migrant status. In the fact that whether or not, when you're looking at whether or not it's the likelihood that a species would actually move upward in its elevational range, <coughs> migrant species, neotropical migrants, which have much lower survival, annual survival, much more turnover, um, and they're certainly far more vagile in many cases than, than resident species, um, have a higher probability of, of shifting their range up. Um, and that might be what we'd expect a priori. Um, at least that's probably that's, that's the case I would make. That's the, that's the situation that we'd expect. So this is, this is a encouraging result um, uh, in, terms of, in terms of life history correlates for this type of behavior. When we looked at upper limits and lower limits, uh, looking first at lower limits, we didn't find any predictor that actually improved our model. Um, so we didn't find any life history correlates that were a significant predictor of whether or not the lower limit would shift up. When we looked at uh, upper limits, um, we only had one, and it was a very strong predictor, which was clutch size. And you might expect, we expected, that higher clutch sizes would be more likely to shift up in elevation uh, because they're producing more young um, and uh, you have more species expanding instead of look in moving off territory. And that's actually not the effect we have. Um, and so this is the results for uh, both, both uh, high elevation species and low elevation species in our three regions. So if you look at these two top lines, which are low elevation species and less than Yosemite, you can see they demonstrate this pattern where low clutch sizes actually had the highest <coughs> probability of, ex of, of expanding their upper limit or shifting up in elevational range. Um, whereas high clutch sizes had lower probability. Um, and I don't have a good explanation for this, uh, but it's what we found. So that's a description of what I found in terms of how species have moved their elevational ranges. Um, but that's sort of on aggregate looking at all species. And what I found sort of when you start looking at individual species is you start seeing some interesting or sort of odd behavior that, it com that comes from the different regions. So if you take an example with the white-headed woodpecker, in Lassen, the species is very, very consistent with our uh, climate change hypotheses. Its upper limit has shifted up, and its lower limit has shifted up. In Yosemite, its upper limit has shifted down, and its lower limit has shifted down. And in the Whitney transect, its lower limit has not changed, and its upper limit has not changed either, once you account for the probability of false absence. So we have one species that is doing three different things in our three regions. And how do we, you know, how do we make sense out of this? Um, and, a, and a lot of what I've been struggling with in the last few years in my dissertation is trying to make sense out of this um, when we expect all species to be responding the same. Um, and I think a lot of it probably has to do with climatic variability and how climate, the ver how climate has changed differentially, even within one region like the Sierra Nevadas over time. And so this is a plot um, in, in climate space with temperature on the x-axis and, and precipitation on the y-axis. And each of these arrows is one of our sites where we surveyed um, in our three regions, and I've added in I-80 for this portion as well. And so the arrows take you from where the site was climatically, historically, in breeding season, temperature and precipitation, and where it is now. And you can see that there's di big differences both across regions and within regions. So last, and for instance, these green arrows have seen huge increases in precipitation relative to pretty small changes in, 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 in temperature, whereas Yosemite has seen really great increases in temperature, particularly at the highest elevations. And the southern Sierras has really had no change in precipitation because there's already a dry zone to begin with um, and has had, in some cases, some pretty extreme warming. 
So if you take all of this in, you might have different predictions or different expectations about how species are going to be responding, particularly on a site-by-site -site level. And so in thinking about this, I got taken back to Grinnell. Um, and uh, a lot of this work was spawned because of the Sackler Symposium um, that happened uh, almost two years ago now. Um, it's some work that, that I started with, with Craig and Steve and Bill Monahan, who was still around then. Um, and so we got thought, thinking about you know, how, how Grinnell defines species ranges and how species, and, and really in correlating, in, uh, relatedly, how species ranges might change. And so he, his seminal paper, where he defines the ecological niche, which you know, then became the Grinnellian niche, uh, was talking about the California Thrasher and the factors that relate and describe the California Thrasher's range. And this got us thinking about how species, these ranges, changes that we see, and changes in the occurrence of species at sites over time <coughs> series, might be related to the ecological niche of species. So we could develop this framework where we can think of this big circle as the environmental niche for a hypothetical species. You know, within this circle, the species does well, thrives, has a positive growth rate, and outside of it, it does not do well. And then we can have a geographic space that we actually have that exists. And a certain portion of the geographic space intersects with the ecological niche for our species. And if we then sample it within that geographic space, where that geographic space intersects with the, the niche, we expect to find the species. And outside of the climatic niche, you do not expect to find the species. And what happens with climate change, just like those, those arrows that I showed earlier, is that each of these sites is moving through climatic space and time. And the question then is, what is happening to the fate of the, that, that species at those sites? If, this, if the climatic niche is not actually impacting where the species moves, then you expect the occurrence to actually stay the same, for these two sites to stay occupied, even though the species, this site is no longer, or expected to be no longer climatically favorable, and this site to be, remain unoccupied, even though it is now climatically favorable. If the climatic niche is actually important in driving these occurrence changes, then you'd expect one site to go extinct and another site to become colonized. In this latter case, we describe as being is, is defining niche tracking, where species are following these sort of these limiting environmental boundaries through geographical space in order to remain in favorable space, favorable climatic space. We wanted to try and test this with our species and with the patterns of, of colonization and extinction that we found. But in order to do this, we actually had to come up with some sort of measure of what the climatic niche for a species is, um, which is not a trivial thing to sort of try and think about. Um, the way we did it was we took um, historical specimen records across the entire ranges of, West, of Western distributed North American species. Um, so we, we went on to Ornis, and we went to the MBZ, and we took out all the historical specimen records prior to 1940 for 53 species. Um, of course, we took the, only the ones that were georeferenced and in the breeding season, and we plotted them, like here, for instance, with the Lashley bunting. Then you can take these, and you can plot them in climatic space, and then use this to really describe, in some ways, is what your climatic niche might be. And we decided, since we don't really actually know that much about the boundaries or what a boundary means in this case, the best description for of the climatic niche that we could come at would be the centroid. So we can take that centroid and we can plot it in relation to where the species was found historically in these blue dots in our in our in, in the Grinnell Survey project, and then where we found it in, in the modern resurvey work. And then those can also be plotted by centroids. And then you can really then just focus on the centroids and look at the relation between them over time. In particular, how has, if this is where the species was in the Sierra Vadas historically, and this is where it is now, how, what's the relationship between these two, and how has this moved relative to this niche centroid? And what we decided was that it wasn't maybe necessarily how close it is now or how far away it was then, but really what direction it was moving. You know, is it moving in the same, are these vectors, this, uh, the vector for where, how it actually moved versus how far the, the direction, the vector from the distance between the historic centroid and the niche centroid, are these signs the same and are they moving in the same direction? So in this case with the largely bunting, we found the species both uh, sort of historically existed in an area that was warmer and drier than it was um, uh, 
than the niche centroid. And then over time, it moved in its, the same direction. So in this case, there would be evidence for tracking, um, for tracking both temperature and precipitation. And now we used this framework to measure 53 different species um, and found, uh, as this table sort of demonstrates, that sort of pretty much 90, all of them, all but five of the 53 species were tracking at least one environmental gradient, either precipitation or temperature. And only five showed no evidence for tracking of either. Um, the, uh, and what we looked, and what, one of the things that struck us about this, and an unexpected result, was you look at these five species, all five of these species are species that are urban adaptable, um, and sort of can be classified a priori as urban adaptable. Um, and as a, if you wanted to go on sort of a thought experiment and say, well, what species might not be having their, you know, their geographic range impacted heavily over the last hundred years by climate, might be species that can, ex you know, can uh, escape climatic variation and escape, and escape climatic pressure by taking advantage of, of human-dominated landscapes. Another uh, uh, sort of thing we found that we did not expect was um, uh, which, looking at which spe whether or not species were tracking temperature or precipitation. Um, so if you look at this, these species are actually ordered in terms of their average elevational range. Um, so low elevation species found that their range was pretty much entirely dominated uh, by tracking precipitation, whereas high elevation species were tracking <coughs> temperature. And a lot of species in the middle were tracking a bit of both. Um, and uh, this is obviously a significant pattern, and it's a question of, it's a, it's a pattern we don't really know how to explain. Um, we know in some cases that uh, if you look at what limits net primary productivity as you move up in elevation, uh, uh, in the lower elevations, NPP is limited a lot by precipitation. In the high elevations, it's limited by temperature. So this might be a signal that the species are actually tracking something entirely different. Um, and that they're not responding directly to temperature and precipitation. They might be uh, responding some, something to something like NPP. Um, but a, certainly an intriguing pattern that we found. The last step with this that we wanted to look at was we wanted to say, okay, we have this evidence of species tracking temperature and precipitation, but how does this actually relate to how we, in some ways, how we predict how species respond to, to climate change in the future? So to, do, to test that, we went back to these historical full breeding range distributions, and we modeled them using Maxent. And we took out of Maxent, um, uh, we modeled them in Maxent using only temperature and precipitation at the breeding season. And we took out of that basically whether or not the climate envelope was best, uh, best contributed, to, uh, was, was most strongly defined by temperature and precipitation to come up with a priori estimates of whether or not the full range of a species was best described by temperature or precipitation. And then we compared that to whether or not the species empirically had tracked temperature or precipitation. And we found, again, really striking, very close relationships. Um, the species whose full breeding range was best described by temperature on a large continental scale were also the species who were tracking temperature over time. And the same is true for pre precipitation. Which gives kind of an encouraging note to people who are actually modeling future ranges of species and trying to see what the future impacts of climate change are, because it means that we're, we might possibly be on the right track, um, even though we can't validate our models or what, how species are going to react in the future. This is giving some indication that at least what, when we do niche modeling and we use Maxent, we're actually pulling out environmental factors that may actually be meaningful, um, which is kind of encouraging. The last step, now, and we've been using centroids and movements of centroids but, I mean, really these movements of centroids are just uh, the manifestation of what's happening at the actual individual sites and changes in, in, in occurrence over time. And so the last step that I wanted to do was uh, really to sort of go back to these actual occurrence patterns and see if we can sort of detect a signal of the niche and the way that niche is driving probably is of, or driving colonization extinction in actual sites. So to do this, I had to build a separate modeling framework. Um, and in this case, we have our niche centroid here. And then we imagine our groups of sites that we've sampled around it. And so theoretically, we expect these, you know, the closer you get to the niche centroid, the more likely then that's where the species is going to be. Uh, uh, that's where the species occurrences are going to be lumped. In a null model, we might expect that over time, if you look at colonizations in green, or in extinctions in red, 
a null model would expect that those those patterns of colonization, colonizations and extinction would, would, extinctions would be random, at least in in, in relation to where the location of that niche centroid. In a separate model, though, what we call our static model, how far you are from the niche centroid determines whether or not you go extinct or become colonized. In this case, the closer you are to the centroid, the more likely you are to become colonized. And the farther out in the periphery you are, the more likely you are to go extinct. Our third model was a model that incorporates the idea of climate change. And that these, the fact that these sites are moving over time. In this case, if you started out really far from the niche centroid and have now moved closer, you are more likely to become colonized. And if you started out, uh, you know, however far away from the niche centroid, but you've now moved very far from the niche centroid, you are more likely to go extinct. So we put these three conceptual models to the test, going back to an occupancy modeling framework and using a two-season model, where we model, in this case, the initial historic probability of occupancy. And then we model the probabilities of extinction, the model of probabilities of colonization. And we can look at what factors best describe the extinction and colonization probabilities. Our null model just has an intercept which says that that's colonization and extinction is random. Our static model uses just how far you are away from the site is from the, from the uh, climatic niche historically. And then our dynamic model, which we did in two parameterizations, uses both how far away you were from the climatic niche historically and how far you are away from it now in the relations between those two. So we took these three different parameterizations and we tested them for our 53 different species. And then for each species, you average across all models and calculate the sort of AIC, cumulative AIC weight for each of the models. Um, and then we've averaged across each of all 53 species to get this table. And so these are sort of weights and evidence in support of these species, model, uh, averaged across 53 species. Um, and what you see is that sort of overall, we have very, very, very little support for this null model. Um, and then the support was, was really split between the static model, which is just saying that the niche is important for driving colonization and extinction, that how far you are away from the niche, and the dynamic model, which says that the niche is really, niche centroid is really important, but it's also important how much you've moved since then. Um, so this is the only one that actually incorporates the idea of climate change. But altogether, this is saying that actual the, this location of the climatic <coughs> niche is the best description we have in actually explaining the individual site dynamics and colonization and extinction at these sites. So some final thoughts uh, to sort of wrap up all that I presented. I mean, certainly we found that birds' ranges have changed a lot. A lot. Um, if you look back at our tables, uh, at, the, at those graphs of, of upper limits and lower limits, you have this signal that species are actually shifting up in elevational range. Um, but there's a ton of variability. You have a lot of species that have shifted down in different portions of their range and their entire range. Um, and you have species that have not shifted at all. So, in some ways, when we're, we're looking for climate change impacts, you know, we can see this signal. Uh, with what Terry Root and others have, have uh, called sort of the fingerprint of climate change. You can see it in our data, and certainly um, I think it's one of the few sort of large regional elevational breeding season studies to do that. Um, but there's a whole lot of other variability there that really shouldn't be ignored. Um, and I think the second pa part of my work has really sort of highlighted the fact that when we're thinking about climate change, we need to be thinking about more than just temperature, um, uh, <coughs> particularly with birds. Um, but I think with all animals, um, there's this idea that, that, that maybe temperature is the only thing that's driving climate change. And I think in California, where we have such extreme precipitation gradients um, and high variability in terms of how that may be changing over time, uh, we should be focusing on that a lot, more so than we are. And in some cases, when you look at a lot of these studies, when you look at individual species, you, you look across and you say, oh, species are behaving individualistically. There's no, there's no framework for how species are, uh, are responding. And I don't have an answer to that, but I think the, what, I, what I take out of the, my work with the climatic niche <coughs> studies is that you know, species all have their unique individual characteristics. And the, they're each, as, as Grinnell described, they're each psychological and physiological things that are describing where they are. And that might be really coming into play how species are shifting their ranges over time. Um, and then the, the trick then is we're looking forward 
in trying to understand how things are responding to features is uh, something that I think Grinnell would approve it of, which is the challenge is in actually trying to figure out what that niche is for each species and how we might incorporate that into understanding <coughs> the future. Um, and this is not a trivial thing at all. I mean, we simplified the situation a lot by calculating these niche centroids, and it worked out. Um, but uh, certainly, that's not going to help us that much in the future. Um, and so the real ch challenge lies, and we're making a lot of progress in it, but the real challenge is, is, is best describing that niche and using that to really understand current distributions, past distributions, and future distributions. Um, so uh, since this is close, I'm going to get to a dissertation defense. I'm going to excuse me for having like an Academy Award moment. Um, <laughs> a lot of people to thank. Uh, foremost, Steve, Fe Steve Beisinger, my main advisor, um, and the rest of my dissertation committee, uh, Craig Moritz, who's been the big leader um, all these years in the Grand Island Survey Project, and then Rory and Justin for shares. Um, I've had a lot of really great field mm -hmm. assistants, although I really call them field leaders. Um, Andrew Rush, who was not even an assistant of mine, but led this project from the start in Yosemite and allowed me to use two years of his data um, for, my, for my dissertation. Um, Allison Schultz, Pascal Title, and Felix Ratcliffe, um, who helped me in Lassen. Uh, in Whitney, Teresa Feo was a big help doing surveys for me. Field assistants included Paul Newsom and Nadi Najjar, and Dan Wade, who got a squirrel. <laughs> Um, and then there's a whole lot of other people. Uh, Michelle and Carla have been huge helps throughout all the time. Um, Michelle always answering all my crazy queries for data that I need now. Um, uh, Bill Monahan, who was a former student here and continues to be a collaborator of mine. Um, the Beisinger Lab has helped a lot. Uh, everyone who's ever worked on the GRP has helped me in some ways. And of course, um, MVZ and has them run funding through some of the time. Uh, and thank you for listening. So we have some time for questions. Bill's got his hand up already. <laughs> seems like one thing that's really missing from your analysis explicitly, although it's implicit, and that's the vegetation. <laughs> and you're dealing with, you mentioned about the product, primary productivity, but there's also structural aspects of vegetation that can be important. So, What's, what are you going to do about the missing vegetation? Well, the missing vegetation is something that's totally plagued us. Um, we got our real, we got our hopes up when we, when we learned maybe four years ago about the VTM project um, and the Wieslander maps and the work that um, Jim Thorne's been doing at Davis and Maggie Kelly and Barbara Allen Diaz have been doing here. And we so we have, to a certain extent, uh, and so the idea of that is there's historical four service surveys that were done with, with detailed plot level data throughout the Sierras in the late 30s and early 40s um, that to some extent has been gone out and resurveyed as well. The problem is the extent of that does not cover our survey areas. It covers Yosemite. Um, it covers basically none of Lassen. There's this huge hole in the northern northeast <laughs> cordon of the state that has no vegetation data, which is very frustrating. Um, and it covers about half of our southern Whitney transect. So I think in time there will be an opportunity to at least on a fine scale in Yosemite to maybe try and use some of the detailed vegetation data to see how it relates to the patterns of birds and mammals shifting that we found. Um, but we just don't have the capability um, across the broad regional scale to look at that. Um, I wish that I wish Gwinnell had also taken, you know, veg plots or something, um, but he didn't. We can't ask that much of him. Yeah, go ahead. So are there any um, reasons to think that changing fire regimes over the past hundred years might influence some of these patterns? Um, certainly, would, it, would, if you look at historical, well, if you look at, if you look at historical photos, and we've done a lot of photo retakes, um, you can see some evidence of, of uh, possible evidence of, of change, shifting fire regimes or fire suppression, really, um, which is going to be changing the forest structure. Um, it's hard to know how much. I mean, it's hard to know how much it how plays into it plays. Yeah. So I'm wondering, uh, I guess this is probably going to be a guess on your part, it's going to have the vegetation data, uh, but as a follow-up to Bill's question, do, do, you, do you sense that, or just what's your feeling, whether the shifts are uh, a response that's sort of mediated by changes in vegetation, or do you think it's an actual physiological 
I've got I've almost gotten in fights over this. <laughs> <laughs> because I actually believe that, that at least some species are gonna have physiological limits. Um, that that may directly like limits in the breeding season, like with, with egg temperatures and, and you know, frequency of severe cold snaps and things. Because we know from fine scale data that's you know that that when you're looking at sort of early breeding season and things like that, the extent to which those things happen will are changing how species range uh, elevational ranges because species can change their elevational range relatively quickly. There's a lot of sort of faculty movements, particularly in, the, in, in during the breeding season, the start of the breeding season, trying to get highest as you can because that's where the least predators are. At the same time as you don't, you can't basically you have a nest failure if you if the entire clutch gets frosted. Um, so I think there's probably some physiological limits. Um, but uh, it's going to be variable. I mean, certainly, probably not all the species we're looking at are going to be reaching physiological limits. Um, but uh, I think probably a certain portion of them are. Um, I would love to test that, um, do fine-scale experiments. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a big unknown at this point. I mean, I, I, I'd, I'd say <coughs> if it's not that, then for, for instance, I think a lot of insectivores are probably going to be impacted by physiological limits on invertebrates that they're eating, um, and that that's actually going to probably be a bigger impact necessarily than changes in vegetation structure. That's my guess. So you may be something I'm not fully understanding, but in the, in the niche tracking, in the perfect equilibrium model, niche tracking means nothing changes in climate space, right? Because they move around to stay at the same conditions. So I guess I'm a little puzzled what niche tracking means. I didn't quite follow the method not related to on the ground. For the for the, the colonization extinction part, right? Uh, maybe even before that, the vectors. That, well, so no, for the, for the vectors, niche track. So you have. So it's whether or not basically this vac the no, I need to put the vectors in. Whether or not this vector has the same sign as this vector. So in this case, this species, you know, these arrows are both moving um, sort of negatively on the temperature axis and positively on the precipitation axis. So So in a case where it would not be niche tracking, it would be moving that way. What's the big score, the big cross the the gray? The gray cross, cross is the is the climatic niche for the species, and this is where we found the species historically in the Sierra Nevadas, and this is where we found the species in our mm -hmm. contemporary surveys. And the historical samples are put on the historical prism data or on to? Yep, yep. So, so I guess I guess it's just conceptual question. So perfect tracking, there should be no movement in climate space. I mean, if the species moves instantaneously to equilibrate with climate, and there's no mismatch of realized in geography, you know what I mean? No well, but it, it's well, yes. Well, it's, it's different in some cases because you have to assume then that the climatic space that defines this range-wide niche is the exact same climate space available to the species in the Sierra Nevadas, and so pretty much these asterisks are always going to be off this to some extent because the species does not have the full <coughs> niche available to it in the clim in climate space. And so what's happening over time is that different climate spaces are becoming available and different climate spaces are becoming less available. And so that's what's moving it in, in different relationships. So for example, if you took the historical data yeah. and then said they didn't move and imposed it on the new climate space, you would get a vector? You would. Uh, sometimes you would get a vector. Yeah. What does that mean? That's not niche tracking. That's the failure to track. Well, it means, that, it means there's probably noise in there. No, but no, that's real. I mean, if the climate moves and the birds don't, you'll get a vector. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's not niche tracking. True, but that doesn't mean that it's moving towards it. What we, what this, I mean, what you're, what, what you will move, you will, you will net track it only if, basically, climate space is moving the Sierra Nevadas towards favorable climate. In towards favorable climate, towards where it is. A species doesn't necessarily have to, if, if you are in a good spot, and you're being moved into a better spot, you don't have to move necessarily in order to, to track climate. 
the way we define it, basically, we conflated this, what you might call active tracking and passive tracking. Okay. That, that, well, that definitely helps. Okay, but yeah. I, but I guess it still leaves me. And, I, and, and I, would, I would like to separate those two out, um, because you're right, in that there's a difference between a species that has moved in order to basically actively track climate and a species that doesn't hasn't had to. We can't say much about the species that haven't had to. But you should be able to unpack it pretty easily by taking the historical location data put it on the modern climate. That's the passive climate. Yes. And then take, and that's one vector. Yes. And the second vector is the new location. Yes. And that hopefully would go from the blue to the red with a little point in between. Yes. And then you, and then uh, would be kind of self think about what that would mean. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, so this is just a, kind of a relate, closely related to that. I was wondering, what time period was you, the big cross um, where That's you took all of the occurrences over what time frame did that come from? That's all pre-1940, in the, in the historical okay. data is pre-1940. So I kind of expected when you first started showing this that you were going to use the difference between Grinnell because that was roughly or closer to the same time period, I guess, as yes. the... Uh, the difference between Grinnell and the, the whole uh, range conditions um, niche as sort of um, to calibrate 